on your bike in association with Safer Roads Humber, taking cycle safety seriously. A slice of seaside charm and a warm Yorkshire welcome. That's what greeted leading cyclists from across the world at this year's inaugural Tour de Yorkshire event. More than 1.2 million spectators are estimated to have come out in force to cheer on the cyclists in a three-day event that took place across Yorkshire in May. Stage one showcased what the stunning East Yorkshire coast has to offer from Bridlington to Scarborough and it's estimated that 250,000 people braved the chilly weather to line the streets. The idea behind the race was as a legacy event in the wake of last year's Tour de France Grand Depart. It was a huge success, it brought 2.5 million to the county and resulted in a 100 million pound boost for the regional economy. The premier event attracted some big names too, including Sir Bradley Wiggins, Thomas Vokler and Samuel Sanchez. Welcome to Yorkshire, along with the Amory Sport Organisation organised the event, seeing it as an outstanding event in the international cycling calendar. So from our point of view as the organisers, what's really important is we get a top class field taking part. So having riders like Sir Bradley Wiggins, Marcel Kittel, Ben Swift, uh, Bernie Eisel, these are great names in cycling. Uh, and having the big teams as well, Yam Cycling, uh, BMC Cycling, uh, Eurosport, Giant Alpacen, Team Sky, Team Wiggins. Um, this is really important for us because it not only means that we've got a top quality sporting event, but it will attract the crowd. So a lot of people will want to come out and salute Sir Bradley Wiggins. Um, this will be the opportunity to see a bit of history in the making and to support a great British, not just cycling icon, but a great British sporting icon. I think uh, for the economy in the East Riding, the Tour de Yorkshire is extremely important. If you look at the the effect that the Tour de France had on Yorkshire's economy, but particularly the places that the Tour de France visited last year. Although this won't be the Tour de France, it will still be significant and it might be uh, between a third and a half as much of an impact as the Tour de France had. So for those places in the East Riding that's getting the, uh, the Tour de Yorkshire, this is a big thing. The profile of Yorkshire has never been higher, uh, you know, and it's almost impossible to put a price on the those wonderful images in the sunshine being beamed around the world of the glorious Yorkshire countryside and the enthusiastic Yorkshire crowds in our big cities. So put all of that together and uh, the impact for tourism in Yorkshire will be uh, exponential over many, many years. Uh, and uh, don't take that from me, take that from the tourism businesses that are already benefiting from it. Stage one of the event covered a geographical span of 174 kilometres, where the riders passed through spectacular coastal scenery, including Bridlington, Bempton, Robin Hood's Bay, Whitby and Scarborough. With its elegant promenades and rugged white cliffs, bright and breezy Bridlington is a tourism hotspot. It has a working harbour and is well known for its shellfish. The Gypsy Race River runs through the town. It's actually a stream which flows into the North Sea in Bridlington Harbour. Now, folklore suggests that when the Gypsy Race is flowing, bad fortune is at hand. But one name which doesn't seem to have had much bad luck over the years is John Bull, or rather, Ernest Hodgson. He set up a rock emporium on Prince Street in 1911. Ernest and his staff delighted customers with their fancy creations of rock making. Over the years, the family business expanded rapidly and in 1984, the company moved to their present location on the Carnaby Industrial Estate. The site offers visitors the chance to tour the factory, a total sensory experience. The, the company was first formed in 1911 wow. uh, by uh, Mr. E.T. Hodgson. They had a shop down on Prince Street where he used to make rock from. Uh, it progressed there, followed on a few years when they started uh, producing different kinds of things like nugget and fudge within the same shop. Then when uh, Trevor took over about 40 years ago, who was in charge now, 
Uh, we've produced a lot more by peanut brittle. We make nugget fudge toffee, and uh, we also make biscuits. Okay. Uh, we also work with chocolate. We use Belgian chocolate. Okay, where we actually just melt it down and we add different flavours to it. You can have your caramel or your mint. And then we pour it into moulds and we chill it out and then we, we actually design it. We do fish, ducks, wow. we do rabbits. So you can get quite Easter creative eggs. with Yeah, you can get very creative with make. it. Yes, we do, yeah. So. The name John Bull, where does that come from? Because obviously it wasn't founded by John Bull, it was founded no. by the Hodgson family. It was. Um, again, when uh, Mr E.T. Hodgson was talking to his son, uh, which is the guy who's got it now, his granddad, his dad. They were trying to decide that Hodgson's Rock wasn't quite the Didn't name. The thing. That's right, Didn't yeah. The thing. So they were coming up with something, trying to look for something a bit more traditional. So they came up with the word John, the name John, after, like picking a baby's name, uh -huh. if, if, you, if you like. So then they had to have something else. John's Rock wasn't quite the spark. So they came up with a British Bulldog. Okay. And that's where they got the John Bull from, for the British Bulldog itself. So it became John Bull Rock. And is, is the business very much still a family business, Albert? It very much is, yeah. Um, as I say, Trevor's still here, and his son's working in the factory floor, as well as his daughter as well. So yeah, we are still very much a family-run business. So tell me about the famous factory tours. What does that actually involve? Well, you, you can come along and you can actually see how rock is made, and actually take part in rolling rock. Wow. Um, for a, a small fee, you can have a letter of your choice put inside the rock and then you actually roll it yourself. It is quite good fun and it is good value for money. What can a cyclist discover here then if they visited the factory? Well, again, they come on the tour and they can discover how rock's made, they can, a, a bit of history. It's not only about making rock, it's about history on sweets itself. We have an history room that tells you about sweets and chocolate in general. Not only what we make, but what's made throughout the world. So they can actually learn that and they can actually have a go at making some rock and a lolly. And we're always welcome cyclists, any kind of, any, any visitors. So we're more than welcome to bring that. We have a cafe as well, so they can stop on the way and have a brew, a cup of tea and a biscuit. And a biscuit, what you've purchased in the shop, no less. That's right. Before I hop on my bike, I'm feeling a creative moment going on. So I'm going to seize the moment and make my own chocolate lolly. Right, we can go do that. Just four miles north of Bridlington is the village of Bempton. It's well known for its cliffs. In fact, Bempton Cliffs is an RSPB nature reserve. Every year, 250,000 seabirds flock to the towering chalk cliffs between Bempton and Flamborough. The height of the season, April to August, sees the cliffs alive with activity. The much-loved puffin also makes its home here between mid-April and mid-July. The team here at Bempton Cliffs provides visitors with a real opportunity to get up, close and personal with the array of seabirds here. The Puffin Patrol is one of their star attractions and is the guided walk which runs twice a day. Keith, Bempton Cliffs, home to 200,000 seabirds I believe. Tell me about its history. Well, these cliffs have been here for a long, long time. Uh, probably since uh, the last ice age over 10,000 10, years ago when the North Sea was flooded and the cliffs would have started to be carved out of the Yorkshire Walls to create this incredible sort of chalk, 350 foot chalk cliffs. It's a breathtaking view. Stunning, absolutely stunning. Breathtaking view. And it's stretching all the way out there to Flamborough Head and just uh -huh. beyond us, Flamborough Lighthouse. Right. And north, almost up to Filey Bay and Hummerby Gap and Filey in the distance. And so we've got over 11 kilometres of chalk cliff and each of the section of that cliff provides home to these incredible seabirds, one of the most important seabird colonies in the whole of Northwest Europe. In the whole of Northwest Europe, not just England? No, absolutely not, no. With, in fact, it's, we think it's a quarter of a million seabirds here nesting here on these cliffs. Incredible. And uh, Incredible. it makes it one of the most important, and it's certainly the most important, mainland colony yeah. in the United Kingdom alone. Keith, the centre is home to eight key species of birds, I believe. What type of birds live and visit here? Yep. Eight, we describe it as the big eight. And these are the seabirds that breed on the cliffs, right. that spend most of their lives right. out at sea. And so as we look down the line of the cliff, 
we can see the, lar the largest British seabird, the gannet, with its five foot wingspan. Because I'm assuming that's these flying across. Exactly that, yeah. Now. Almost like a little squadron of gannets yeah. coming past us as we speak. Yeah. And that's just a, a fraction of the 22,000 gannets that are nesting on these cliffs and providing the largest mainland gannetry in the United Kingdom. But we've also got rows and rows of tens of thousands of little miniature penguins almost or in the orc family called guillemots. Okay. Uh, guillemots which nest on these ledges, they don't build any nest at all, they right. just lay this egg about this big and lay it down on that stone ledge and then look after it for 30 odd days until the chick hatches and the chicks are just hatching now as we're here and you can start to hear occasional calls of the guillemot chicks, the first ones. And then there are razor bills dotted about, usually at the top of the cliffs on their own, very similar to the guillemots. And hopefully we'll get a chance to look at them later on and see the difference between them. And then we've got these small gulls that are flying everywhere. And these are the kittiwakes. This is for anybody, because this is one of the only places in, probably in the world where you can actually get this close to these seabirds. Because and the gannets come safety. very up close and personal, don't they, the, when you're stood here at the... the they the definitely, top viewing area. definitely into your personal space. Absolutely. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. And, and because of the safety of the fencing, the viewpoints, the platforms that we've got, it means anybody yeah. can access these sites. Uh -huh. If whether you're in a wheelchair user, whether you're with a push bike, whether you're with a pram, anyone can get down here. Time to hop on my bike again now as I head up north to Scarborough. So join me in part two as I become surrounded by marine life, uncover the story of a famous literary icon and head out to sea on a pirate ship. On your bike in association with Safer Roads Humber, taking road safety seriously.